Welcome to the High Value Sales Show of Eversprint.com. I'm Malcolm Louie, the managing member of Eversprint, and today we're speaking with Ryan Wright, the founder and CEO of DoHardMoney.com, a provider of short-term funding for real estate investors. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Ryan, you grew your company's revenue from 2.5 million in 2015 to 6 million in 2018, a 142% increase. Before we talk about how you grew your company so fast, can you briefly share what your company does beyond my quick intro and how your company differs from the competition? Yeah, you bet. Um, we're kind of unique because we're, we're in a niche service. So um, we target and uh, go after people that are aspiring or scaling uh, real estate investors or people that are looking for financial freedom. Um, we provide them tools, resources, um, software, and also capital so that they can make investments and get passive income or additional, additional income. So uh, that's kind of the, the big highlight of, of what we do. And it makes us different. Uh, a lot of companies will either offer like real estate coaching or those things, or they'll offer uh, the capital, but they don't offer both of them. And we found a need in the marketplace and, and have been fortunate enough to uh, provide great service and good value. Awesome. What were the three biggest drivers of your sales growth from 2015 to 2018? Well, I think the, the first thing that really comes to mind is just being different. Um, so I think that lots of people try and do the same thing that everybody else does. And uh, although there is uh, wisdom in following a path that's been already created, um, if you're following the exact same path and you're going after a thousand pound gorilla, you're going to get crushed. Um, so I think it's a combination of uh, following a path that has success, but di differentiating yourself enough um, that there's unique selling propositions to go against that thousand pound gorilla in, in the marketplace. So I think it's the, it's the uh, having following a path and being different enough um, that doesn't take you away from what got that other company successful, but makes you competitive against them. So I, I would say that's the first one. Okay. How about number two? You know, I, I couldn't, and I'm, this is not like a, a plug for the podcast, but it really sales is key. Um, you know, it doesn't grow and nothing happens until something's sold. And um, we really have a, a, a different take on sales where sales is a noble pursuit and um, sales is about helping people understand what they want and what they need and helping to provide the right solution to them. So I think um, having sales, we've, we've done some automation with sales and we've used some technology with sales. And I would say um, using like introducing SMS, introducing ringless voicemail, introducing, you know, text drops or, you know, automation, some of that type of stuff so that we can warm people up through the process, I think is really big. Okay. And you mentioned your podcast. Your podcast is a channel for growing your sales? It is. Yeah. So um, I'm the host of Income Hacker Podcast. And um, that's a channel for us to uh, reach out to people and build relationships uh, with people we don't know so they can get to know us without, um, without having to give us their information. So when they, when they do come, they're more attuned with who we are um, so that we can acquire uh, better customers uh, that already know, like, and trust us. Okay, got it. And how about your third driver, number three? Marketing. Um, marketing is changing. Um, the way marketing is happening is changing. Um, and so it's the balance between uh, paid marketing and um, SEO uh, that we're getting, um, not having to pay uh, for that type of traffic and some offline traffic things that we're doing. So I think that the third key really is marketing and um, making some changes to get lower cost um, uh, customer acquisition. Okay. Uh, going back to your, to number one, being different, who's the th thousand pound gorilla in your space and how are you doing things differently from them? Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I hate to name, name drop on a few of them because, uh, but there, there's a few of them. So I think there's, there's really two categories. The thousand pound gorillas are going to be either the, the coaching companies. So there's companies out there that teach you how to uh, do real estate investing. Um, and there's some big ones out there. You know, you've got like your, your, uh, 
Robert Kiyosaki's or you've got some of your big name type stuff and they usually hire a, a company that does the sales and marketing for them. Um, and so there are companies you probably haven't heard of before, but you would have heard of the, the, the name brand people. And then you've got companies, big companies um, that are in the lending space. They're lending non-traditional, non-conforming lending. Um, lots of those are hedge funds um, where they've, uh, they've got other brands that they're, they're operating under. And so we kind of have thousand pound gorillas on both sides of the table there. Um, but nobody's done both of it where they say, well, what happened is we started out funding and um, when 2008 hit, and the crisis happened, um, you know, it had an effect on us. And uh, we sat back and did a SWOT analysis and said, what's one of our strengths? And one of our biggest strengths is our phone rang off the hook. Um, but the problem was um, we got to the point where we had to turn the phones off because we had nothing we could sell those guys. We couldn't add value to them and it was too expensive because the phone call, everybody would call and say, hey, will you give me a loan? And we'd say, well, if you don't have judgments, collections, these things, and yeah, we'll, we'll give you a loan. We base upon the asset of the property, not the person. And, uh, and then we would never hear from them again. And so when we sat back and we were re-strategizing, restructuring, we said, why don't we give those guys some value? And so we started building out some tools, resources, courses, software. And we said, hey, let us give you stuff so you can go find those great properties. And so we've grown from there. And that's probably been one of the biggest things is that pivot for us of saying, we're not just going to be a lender. We're not going to be in the coaching you know, space. We're going to be a hybrid of the two of those, um, which is unique and different. All right. Got it. And in terms of lending, how do you get the capital to lend? Do you have a partner that actually does the lending for you or do you raise money yourself through some sort of uh, fund and then you're just relending those funds? How does that work? Yeah, great question. So um, we've made the choice to just work with private investors. Um, so we work with accredited investors, um, provide uh, returns for them. Uh, they are able to select deals. You know, I want this deal or that deal. So kind of a, a matching service. Um, an accredited investor can, can apply, be on the platform. Uh, we bring deals. They say, yes, these are the ones I want. We underwrite to a certain criteria and then uh, they're able to pick it up. We take care of finding, acquiring, valuing, underwriting, um, and then servicing that, uh, that asset for them so they can be a, a truly passive investor and, and getting you know, really solid returns secured against first position real estate. Now, are you actively seeking those out as well, or do you have a pool that's sufficient for your needs? We're always looking for money um, as we expand or there's new states or we're growing. Um, we're a constantly growing company. We grew, you know, 142%. Uh, and so there's, there's constantly a need for that, um, you know, and, and clarifying to be really clear, that's not money to be um, operational capital or investing in our company. It's investing in investments um, that we're able to to uh, find and vet for people so they're they're owning those assets. Right. Got it. Now, how do you find these guys? Or, or are they coming through to you through in, Income Hacker, your Income Hacker podcast as well? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, um, a ver variety of ways. The number one way is, you know, we obviously started just with our personal network and, you know, people we met. I started as a real estate agent, actually, and uh, helped uh, investors liquidate properties and buy properties. And a lot of them said, hey, I'd rather not have to worry about toilets and management and those things, but I wanna make good returns. And so the idea, the concept of hard money lending for some of your listeners may be a little foreign and feel like Guido or you know something like that that's gonna break your legs. But the, the concept of hard money lending is lending on the hard asset, not the soft asset. So we look at the property exclusively um, and if there's enough value in the property, that's how we assess our risk where like a Bank of America or Chase or those types of things assess their risk based upon the ability to repay the loan. We don't really care if the guy can repay the loan. That's not what we're going after. A lot of contractors and those guys might not have great income or it's up and down. Um, you know, real estate agents, it's up and down. Real estate investors, it can be up and down. What we care about is, is there value in the property? And if there's value in the property, that's what we use to collateralize against. We typically lend 70% of the, the property value once it's fixed up the ARV. And so we have about a 30% spread there. And uh, that's how we securitize. Um, and so that, that's one of the things that makes us quite a bit different. Right. Does that mean that the people who uh, go through your program for funds, they need to come up with 30% on their own? No, actually, if they can find a good enough deal, which is what our system, we have some finding systems and softwares and ways to find properties. And, uh, you know, you can do out of state owners, non or occupied, finding people that have property. So we teach people to go and find properties that are distressed. And it's either a distressed, it's a personal distress 
or a property distress, preferably both. So if somebody's going through a bankruptcy or in foreclosure or going through a divorce, that's a personal distress. Then we're also looking at property distress. Does the property need work? Is it in bad condition? If so, that property cannot be sold to someone that's going to go to Chase or Bank of America or Wells Fargo or whatever to get a loan. They simply cannot get a loan through those resources because the property is not in a condition to be inhabitable. So those types of places won't do loans. And so our, um, our people, our members are going after and helping people solve problems. Maybe it's an inherited house or it's a bankruptcy or it's a foreclosure and they're saying, hey, let me buy the property. I'll take it over. Nobody else can buy it because it needs to be a cash or a hard money transaction. And then they're uh, take it, taking it and uh, fixing the property up um, and either reselling it or renting it or something like that. Um, so it's able to sell, solve the problems. If they can buy that property at good enough, if they can buy that property for 70% of the after repaired value, the purchase, the rehab, the closing costs, the payments, then we can fund um, uh, 100% of the purchase, the rehab. And in some cases, we can even fund a little bit more than that. Um, if not, let's say the purchase, the rehab, the closing cost is over that 70, let's say it's 80, um, and the property's worth 100,000, then they'd have to come up with $10,000 in that scenario, and we'd come up with $70,000. Right, got it. So potentially, you could uh, buy a property with a very little dollar investment on your side. Well, and that's one of the things we talk about. We, are, we promote 100% financing and uh, you have to find the right property or you have to apply some other strategies. And so some of the other strategies are getting a line of credit. Um, so if you have okay credit, you can get a line of credit. You can also partner. So we have a lot of people that will get a business partner. Somebody's got money in a 401k or an IRA, not making much money and they'll either partner on debt or equity. So they'll get an initial loan from us that we, we don't allow that uh, partner to secure against the property. So it has to be an unsecuritized loan or it has to be, they could be part of the LLC that owns the property and have an ownership split if they want to do like an equity play. So, you know, everybody's got a, uh, an aunt uh, uh, Tilda that's got some money in her 401k or in the bank, even worse, where she's losing money on it. Um, you know, each, each year, especially if you look at inflation, um, that can put up 20 or $30,000 to make a deal like that happen, um, which can be a great return for her, um, and can get, get people started in game. So we, we focus on ways that you can get started with little to no money. Um, and, and the, the, it really, you've got to find a good deal. That's, that's kind of the catalyst, which is what our, our program helps people do. Right. Now, will we be able to find a property in a well-to-do area that doesn't really have the stress? physical assets, ones that are run down and, and, and need a repair? Oh, absolutely. Like I have not found a zip code. Like our software will tell us what's in foreclosure, what's in bankruptcy, what's, it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're in million dollar neighborhoods. Uh, sometimes there's more in million dollar neighborhoods. Um, I looked up a, a neighborhood here locally and uh, you know, there's multiple things going on in properties. That said, it may not be a good investment for you. So you know, just because it, it's a good deal doesn't mean it's a good deal for everyone. Um, so you know, you may not want to be investing those. We, we teach people to be going after um, blue collar neighborhoods and um, you know, you want to be in the median price ranges, not in the high price ranges when, when markets shift, when things happen. Um, those have the less, the least amount of um, ups and downs. They're affected the least, and and also rents and and resales stay pretty steady. So we we um, have people go after median price ranges in the area, and uh, if that's unavailable, like a lot of guys from California just have a hard time getting cash flow or finding types of deals. There's lots of deals to be had in California if you're flipping or wholesaling. But if you're going to do a, a multi-million dollar flip, there's a lot more risk on that. So um, in, in those types of care scenarios, you've got to go outside of the area that you're in or look at out-of-state investing, which um, is really lucrative, um, especially if you set up your team correctly. Right. Now, for your members who participate in your program, is, are they, is it a flipping model or is it an investment model? Yeah, so it's all of the above. So it depends on where you're at. So we try and meet people where they are. Some people come to us and they're just getting started. And so they need to learn the marketing fundamentals. They need to learn the real estate fundamentals. They need to learn finding properties. And they've got to go out there and either spend money on marketing or spend time on marketing, making multiple offers. We have a software called the Next Deal Blueprint, which basically lays out how to find a property in the next 90 days and puts a customized plan together for you on what you want to do. If you want to spend time, you want to spend money, it tells you how many offers you have to make, how many properties you have to visit, how many postcards you have to send, whatever the case is. 
is. It puts basically a, a for, for your listeners, it's, it's a marketing and sales plan together to get your next deal um, and how you're going to go about doing that's customized to you and your specific situation. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's one of the things. And then from there, you start using the tool, tools that we have, like Investor's Edge software, which is, you know, one of our softwares on finding properties, you know, which properties have equity. So we know how much, how much everybody owes on their property. So we can, we can plug it in and know how much is owed. We, we guess that a little bit. We do a reverse amateurization. So we have a good idea. And then we use an AVM model. So we have an idea what the property's worth. And then that gives me properties I can then market to. And then I sub, I take that list and look against properties that may be in distress or maybe free and clear properties or maybe rental properties or out of state owners. And then I can get a really good list of people that I want to target. Um, and so those are some of the types of, of uh, unique things that we offer to our, to our members. Right. But like, would a members, would members use your program to buy investment properties for them to find properties that are, you know, offer the good value, the 30% upside? and just simply buy and hold it as an oh, investment yes. property? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So people will come into wholesale properties, fix and flip properties, uh, buy and hold properties. There's a strategy called a Burr strategy where you buy it, you um, rehab it, then you rent it, and then you refinance it. So you can get into rental properties with uh, little to no money down as well when you use a hard money lender um, because um, the, you can get a bank refinance because now the property is refinanceable. Um, mm -hmm. And so then you can get into very little money into to a deal for a rental property as well. Right. Okay. Got it. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about driver number two. Uh, sales is key. You talk about automation, SMS, uh, ringing us voicemails, your income hacker podcast. How much of your sales comes from inbound marketing efforts and how much of it comes from outbound efforts? Yeah, so everything's inbound. So we're not doing outreach. So, well, I should say this, we're generating leads. Um, we're not buying leads or doing anything else like that. So we, we may be outreaching to those people, but they reach out, they raise their hand first to us. Um, so we're exclusively generating interest. And so as a, a lot of your listeners probably know, it's a sales funnel, right? So at the high end of the funnel, it's how can we create value for people? And then the next level of the funnel is what lead magnet can we use? What can we give them that's high enough value that in exchange, they will give us their name, their phone number, and their email address. Um, so free book, free report, um, seven day trial, whatever the case may be. So we're constantly playing with those types of things. Um, and then from there, it's how do we follow up with these people? And so our goal from there is to get them on the phone. Um, so we may ask them to do like a short form to ask some questions and then give them a scheduling link to schedule um, or we'll put them in and just call them um, immediately. One of the things we like to do is call them as soon as the leads generated. Um, so within a minute or two, we've had people say, hey, I was just filling out your form and, um, and you called me. Um, I think that instantaneousness, um, it, it, a few people, it's like that was really fast. And I think they're impressed by that and, and know that we're on top of things. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, utilizing technology to your, to your benefit, and uh, it can be really helpful in, in growing an organization. How are you getting people to raise their hand and express interest? What's that? That's the first step there, right? Yeah. So, um, it, before the lead magnet, just general interest. Right. Like how okay, are you getting yeah. people to even find you guys, to check you guys out, to yeah, then raise so their hand? Yeah, great question. Most of that stuff's just done through our SEO efforts, our search engine optimization efforts. Um, and then we'll also do paid efforts as well. So um, we'll have videos, we'll have um, intriguing things, things people are like, oh, that's interesting. But even before that, I think getting in front of a crowd that's already interested. So we're not trying to just put a billboard on I-15 and say, hey, here you go. What we're trying to do is get in front of people that have already expressed interest in real estate investing or personal finance or financial freedom. So what we're trying to do is get in front of those people in, in whatever groups or circles. So we may be targeting them on Facebook or we may be targeting them on uh, Google search or we may be targeting them just on a search or Google paid e pay PPC either way. But we're trying to say, where do these people hang out? Where can we find these people that are already talking about this? So we already know. For us, a lot of real estate agents, general contractors, and loan officers make up probably about half of our, of our clientele. And the other half are people that are usually professionals 
um, that are looking for, you know, how, what's my exit strategy look like and how can I grow that exit strategy? Um, because maybe they're turning 40 or, you know, they're like, what does this look like? What does the end game look like? And, and so those types of people will go after. So I, th I think to directly answer your question, it's where, the, where are our customers hanging out? And so we do a lot of lookalike audiences. We take our current customer base and say, what, where's the lookalike audience for these guys? And what keywords are they searching? And then we'll create articles or blogs or videos and those things to try and get the interest. So we're not trying to create the demand. We're trying to get in front of the demand that's already there and show them that we're here. Right. Do you do all this in-house or do you have partners to help you with it all? Yeah, so uh, most of it's done in-house. We do have some um, relationships, uh, but we have a marketing department and uh, we've got a vice president of marketing um, and we've got creative and some of those things are in-house and then we obviously fill that in because marketing, there's a, you know, marketing's a lot like surgery. You know, there's a lot of specialization. So um, it's virtually impossible for us to have every specialist on staff um, but we'll kind of, we'll have the plan, um, we'll have the key roles, and then we'll delegate out some specialization and, um, and then grow from there. Okay. Do you, do you outsource a lot of your marketing or is it just a small amount? I'd say probably 30%. Um, probably 70% in-house, 30% uh, um, out, outsourced. Can you share what those 30% are and why you chose to outsource it as opposed to yeah, sure. hiring someone to do it? Yeah, absolutely. So in-house, we've got our vice president of marketing. Um, we've got um, SEO and social. Um, so that's, that's in-house as well. And then we've got content creation. So writing and, and those types of things. And then videos are done in-house as well. Um, what we send out is like the video um, editing. Um, so editing and production. The production is done in-house, but the editing's out. Um, a lot of our podcasts and some of our social advertising is out. Um, a lot of our paid is, um, we've got a Facebook specialist and we've got um, a Google specialist. The paid is um, out of the office, but our vice president of marketing oversees that and, and works with them. We've tried to, we're not working with agencies necessarily, although they are agencies, but they're more, you know, small couple of, couple of people um, groups. And we like that because they can understand our brand, our culture, who we are. Um, and so that's, that's worked out really well for us rather than hiring agencies. Um, but I think it all depends on the size of your company and what you're trying to achieve. Um, but for us, that's been a good strategy. Right. So what's the decision behind outsourcing it, those, those aspects, as opposed to bringing someone on board to do it internally? Great question. Um, we've had it all internal. I am, I've never had it all external. Right now we have the hybrid where mostly internal and some external. Um, I think the, there was two big reasons for outsourcing that. Um, we got a better quality, um, better quality work and better results is really what it came down to. Um, what we found is, for us anyway, from what we had in, in office versus out, um, we just got better quality that gave better uh, lower cost lead generation and, and good quality leads as well. And I think it's, um, I think they're more working on their skills, they're developing, they um, know that if they're not getting better, then they can lose their job faster than someone that's in office. I think uh, somebody that's in office, at least from our experience, can tend to get a little bit um, uh, complacent is probably the right word, where I think some of the, um, the ones we've hired, they're out of the office, are constantly learning, growing, looking for the new things. And um, they realize their job is more at jeopardy and it could change tomorrow. Like we don't have big contracts. I could say, I'm sorry, um, we're changing today and they would be out where I think some people in office feel like it's going to take months and, you know, before they, something could happen. And I think they tend to get complacent. Um, I, I mean, that's a gross overgeneralization. Um, but from our experience, that's been what's, what's been working for us as we've, as we've transitioned to a hybrid model. Right. And your third driver, and you've touched about this before, the marketing and your paid versus SEO. Which, what has been your best channel for generating interested leads so far? Well, I mean, you can't, about 60% of our traffic comes from a paid and about 40% of our traffic comes from organic is what we call it. Um, so to give you an idea on, on that, as far as where the paid comes from, um, it's a variety from Google to Bing to Facebook to Instagram. Um, so, and, and that 
changes. It depends on, you know, what's happening. So we're watching that daily, obviously. And then we'll over, we'll look at that for the month and see what's happening. The real question is how do you compete in getting the lowest cost per customer acquisition? Uh, that's really the key, key to life for, I think, any business is what does it cost you to acquire a customer? And um, a few months ago, our cost per customer acquisition was extremely high. And over the last few months, as we've made a few modifications in marketing, we've cut it almost in half, uh, which is unbelievably good. And so one of the things we also did is we looked at our re-engagement, what we call re-engagement. And so I think a big key is capturing the data. So the sooner you can give a lead magnet to someone and you can get their name and their email and get them out of whatever platform they're in, the better. And then you've got to say, how can I engage those people to take them to the next level? So then we're creating our own list. So we've got our own email lists and we've got our own database and that's critically important, I believe. And then from there, it's how do we market to them? And another big thing we've had this year is we found that the way we were engaging those people wasn't being reached. The email service we were providing was horrendous. They claimed to be amazing. So we had concerns about it because we saw our re-engagement uh, revenue continue to go down. So we did a split test and we took some of our leads and we put it in the one platform, the other platform. We emailed the same leads on different days and we saw the open rate and click-through rates and those things. And, and uh, this platform was horrendous. And so we ended up making a change on, on the platform and all of a sudden our open rates and, and lead and re-engagements and everything just went through the roof. Um, along with using SMS, um, text messaging, um, I think is just huge. Now there are um, uh, regulations around that. You have to get opt-in for text message and that stuff. But the reality is it's pretty simple. You just say, you're, by subscribing, you're giving us authorization to text you as well. I'm not an attorney, but it's something to keep in mind, but it's pretty easy to do from my perspective. Uh, and so then we started just some re-engagement efforts. And so I would say for this year, um, figuring out why re leads weren't re-engaging and re-engaging them at higher levels using some um, technology has been really big. Right. You find that people like being marketed to by SMS? I believe people love to be marketed to if they're interested in what you're offering. So my thing is, I don't think you can over communicate because if it's kind of like, if you like, I don't know, say, say you like boats, you know, and you just love water skiing, you know, like you want to know everything about water skiing. You want to know the newest thing and the newest this and the newest this. And I don't care if I get a bunch of emails. So I don't think you can over communicate. I think SMS needs to be personal. I don't think it needs to be blast. And so what we've done, we do very little, what we call batch and blast, where we just email or text message everybody. We'll occasionally do that for a big announcement or something. But for the most part, the text message is automated, but it's a two-way text message and it comes from the last person they spoke with. So when you get the text message, it's like, hey, hey, Malcolm, it's Ryan, just checking in with you again. I hope you're doing well. I thought you'd love this article. And if you reply to that and say, oh, Oh, this is awesome. It hits my, so the initial one, you, I didn't know it even went out the system did it. But when you say thumbs up, all of a sudden it ends up on my computer as a text message. And then I can be like, Oh yeah, what's new in your life? You know, how can I help you? So I think the text has to be personalized. Um, it, and that makes it quite a bit uh, more beneficial. Right. Yeah. I have to tell you the SMS text messaging that I get from people out of the blue, especially around, election season it just drives me nuts <laughs> yeah i'm with you yeah i'm i'm totally with you well and i think that the if you're text messaging to traffic or to leads that you purchased i don't think they care about you but if i'm text messaging to somebody that's watched the videos and subscribed and gotten a copy of my book and maybe spoken to somebody here at the office and you know it's like hey you spoke with darren um you know and darren it's auto sending from darren um, I think it's a different story than just like, hey, vote for, you know, Billy Bob. Yeah. And SMSs are coming from, when you mean SMS, you mean like the phone SMS. You're not talking about Facebook Messenger and those sort of. Correct. Yeah. I'm talking about text message. Right. Okay. I do and think there's a great place for Facebook Messenger. We're not doing a great job with that. Um, I think there's more that can be done there that we're, we're missing the boat on. Um, but I'm talking like on your cell phone. Right. And how does it show that's coming from Ryan? Because oftentimes when I get these SMS messages, it's just a phone number. Yeah, it's a phone number, but I'm putting in the message, you know, you know, from Ryan or, you know, you know, I'm, I'm able to address you. Hey, Malcolm, I thought you'd love this article. Let me know if I can help, you know, Ryan. And it's coming from my 
phone number too. So when the automation goes out, it actually outbound sends it from my phone number. Mm -hmm. So if you have corresponded with me in the past, you have that phone number. Um, and so then it would show it's coming from me. Um, so if you save my number, that would show up. Otherwise, it would show our past correspondences. Um, or I would just you know, directly uh, reference you and reference myself in that automation. And then when the replies happen, I can, I can then continue. But it's coming from my phone number. Hmm, good. Yeah, the, uh, it's apparently the new version of the Apple iOS, iOS 13, there, it will have a way to block calls from people who aren't in your address book or whose email, whose uh, phone number is not in past emails. And I'm not sure if they do it on the SMS side as well, but if they also do similar sorts of filtering, you'll be in good shape, right? Because yep. you've already communicated and your, your phone number is already in, on the phone somewhere. So yeah, we'll still and, get through. Yeah, and I'm not convinced. I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm just not convinced. Yes, I mean, if they've already saved me in their favorites or whatever the case is, which we encourage people to do, and we could do on the phone calls, but I'm not as convinced that everybody wants every phone call blocked. I think it's going to lead to other problems like, Oh, you know, my kid's school called and they weren't saved in the favorite and they called from one of the phone numbers. Like I, um, I, I think that's got a ways to go before it's going to benefit people. I recognize the whole idea is, Hey, I don't want spammers calling me, you know, and those types of things. But I think there's going to be a lot of unintended consequences around that, that people are going to try and be like, Oh my goodness, I missed the call from the dentist or whatever. And, uh, I think it can, I, I think people are not going to get the benefit they're looking for out of that, at least at this point. Right. Well, when, when my phone does upgrade, I'm going to, I'm going to switch it on and see how it works. Yeah. So let I me know. Us. Yeah. Because so, I mean, so save me to your favorites before you do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently you don't even need to be saved to the favorites. The phone will somehow scan your past emails and look for phone numbers. Oh, interesting. Within those emails. And then those get whitelisted automatically. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then yeah. that wouldn't be an issue either because we'd be emailing them as well. It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see how that works. Yeah. I mean, if you see a drop off over the next six months, it might be related to this filtering maybe because right? iPhones maybe. are very popular, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So uh, looking forward a little bit, what are your plans to continue to grow the business? Yeah. Great question. Um, there's several things that we're working on. So we're trying to um, in the past, we've got a little bit broad and we're trying to get deeper. So we're trying to um, go deeper into areas. So um, we're trying to get deeper into certain states and geographically um, rather than being broad. Um, so we've gotten a little too broad in some cases, um, too many states or too many areas. And so we're looking at, to get deeper into some of those areas. The second thing that we're looking to do is actually um, have more product offerings on the lending side. Um, where we can offer more um, lending options. And then the other thing in, is the Income Hacker podcast that we're, um, we're going crazy with and trying to promote that into the brand. So our whole thing with Income Hacker um, is uh, creating a brand around that with uh, people that can know, like, and trust us uh, before we even try and get them into our funnels. So why is Income, ha income Hacker such a core component and priority for you? Um, we believe that we can get better. So when people come and sign up with us, um, the, the struggle that we have is we've got to get the right people. Um, because if we have someone that's like a lottery seeker or a casino wants to be, you know, a slot machine guy, um, those guys don't do well in our program and we want good relationships. Um, if they think, Oh, I can enroll, I can pay some money and all of a sudden I'm making money and I'm a millionaire. Uh, it, they, they forget the element of work and uh, that's really important. And so what we're hoping with our income hacker and growing that is that we can establish the principles and things that need to be done uh, to be successful, which work is, is high on the list and then provide the tools and resources. So we, we are hoping to have a more meaningful customer or a more educated customer that's coming in the door um, so we can better serve that customer long-term um, so that's one of the big things. And then secondly, we just believe in our mission. Um, our mission is to help people get to financial freedom, uh, financial independence. And we just believe in the mission. We believe it's possible if you'll take some steps. And so uh, Income Hacker goes broader than just real estate. Um, it goes through like relationship with money and legacy, teaching your kids financial principles. Um, and then we get into like the intentional spending and side hustles. And then we get into like um, putting your cash flow plans together um, so that's, that's the big stuff that we're doing there. So I, I love the, the concept around that. And, and I think financial, 
uh, financial principles are not taught in this country. I think it's a shame it's not mandatory in schools, and um, we're out to kind of change that. Right. Now, for people to be a member at dohardmoney.com, is it a paid membership or is it a free membership? How does that work? Yeah, so obviously we've got a variety of different things, but our, our core is a, is a paid offering that gives offers to multiple, uh, four different software programs, trainings, access to the capital. Um, but depending upon what somebody needs, um, we have different programs. But yes, our whole thing, when, when people pay, they pay attention. Um, so we have like Income Hacker has lots of free information um, where our blog and, you know, those types of things. And then from there, it's like if you want help getting to the next level, um, these are the tools and resources you're going to need. And, and we find people that make an investment, people that pay, pay attention, like you said. Um, and then those are the ones that take action and then they utilize the money and that's what they really want. Um, so we really want people to make a commitment to themselves. What's the, what are the price points of your programs? Um, so they're going to range anywhere. We have stuff that's as low as like 50 to several hundred dollars up to $3,000 um, for like a full suite of products. This is on a monthly basis or no. one time? Yeah. So our, like our 3000 at the moment um, is uh, six months and uh, some of our other products could be monthly, could be one time. It just depends on what somebody's looking for. But our, our core offering is a, a $3,000 product that's a six month of uh, four different softwares and services and support. Right. So also looking forward, what do, you, what do you foresee as the biggest challenge? What's, what's coming? What's the impending wave that you either want to capitalize on or perhaps you want to get out of the way and not get you know, wiped out by it? Well, I think one of the things that's happened is hedge funds um, are bringing more and more capital into this alternative lending space. And one of the things that they've done is they've been driving down the cost of capital. So people that were lending money at, you know, I don't know, four points and 15% interest are now having to lend money at two or three points and 12% interest. Uh, and so we're seeing that cost of capital drive down as the hedge funds are coming in. I think it's good and bad news. The, the good news is, is they see this as a viable investment, um, which we've been saying for decades. Um, the bad news on it is it's driving the cost of capital down. So one of the things that we've been really focused on is offering more than just cash. Um, if we are offering, if we're just offering money, then we're a commodity and we don't want to be a commodity. We actually want to be a full service. So for us, we're going after people that are newer, getting started and the, it's, they can't go to the, a hedge fund to try and get capital um, because they don't have experience and money down. So we tend to lend to people with no experience, very little money down, not necessarily the best credit. Um, and so that creates an opportunity for us. But I would say the, the pen on the horizon is the more influx of um, you know, hedge fund capital coming into these streams and you know, the disruption that that's starting to cause and will continue to cause. And the differentiation for us is to just be a step outside of it um, where, because the hedge funds are really looking for, even though they say they're hard money lenders, they're looking for credit, good credit and experience and money down and those things. Um, so they're not really true hard money lenders. So staying true to the true hard money lender and offering more than just capital um, makes a big differentiation for us. And uh, I think the, the, the wave of the, the hedge funds coming in is the concern. So will you be competitive with the lower cost of capital that the hedge funds are providing or will you provide additional services and be a exactly. little bit more costly? Yeah, no, we don't, yeah, we don't want to be competitive with the hedge funds. That's not our okay. goal. Our goal is to offer more services so it's worth the cost. So the reality is if nobody else will lend you money, um, it doesn't really matter what I charge as long as I can help you find a deal that you can make a profit. Um, so the question, you know, what do you charge for funds? The, the answer typically is how much money are you going to make on the deal? You know, and if you're going to make 30 grand and I'm going to make five grand, is that worth it? Um, especially if there's nobody else out there that's going to help you or allow you to get capital. Um, and then as you get more experience and then you want to start putting money down, then we'll look at lowering cost of funds to become more competitive, but we still want to be a, a value service provider. We don't want to be, you know, Walmart fighting over who's the cheapest money because the commodity business is hard, especially if you're not the hundred pound gorilla um, in, in the marketplace. Right. Got it. Ryan, it's been, uh, actually Ryan, there's a, before I get into that, three last questions for you. Um, you if you had a billboard along the freeway, that's only going to be seen for six seconds or less, 
what would be that billboard message? Financial freedom, 10 years or less outside the Wall Street casino. All right. So what do you mean by outside the Wall Street casino? Yeah, so one of the things we try and do in our marketing is attract the people we want and repel the people we don't. So what we find is most people that want to be stock market investors, um, day traders, and those things don't make great real estate investors. So we want people that if you're wanting to get into that stuff, we don't want you to call us. And if you're pissed off at Wall Street because you lost a bunch of money or there's bad trades or, you know, your stock broker screwed up or whatever the case is, we, that, that attracts you to us. So the idea of outside the Wall Street casino gets us the clientele that are looking for alternative investments and not looking for, you know, day trading or stock trading. Right. Got it. And can you share again who your ideal members are? Yeah. So, um, about 50% of our members are general contractors, real estate agents, or, um, uh, mortgage loan officers. The other 50% are, um, mid-level, uh, uh, employees that are in their mid forties. It's about 75%, yeah, 70% male, 30% female age ranges, typically 25 to 50, um, which is pretty broad. And they're looking for alternative investments. And lots of them have had some life circumstance that have happened where they're kind of just a little upset. And they're saying, I need to take control of my financial future. All right. Are there any other qualifiers that you have? No, I mean, you've got to have some capital to get started. And you've got to be willing to, to do the work. Um, that's one of the things we want people that are willing to work. So we're looking for three, three, three things, time, money, and motivation. So you got to be willing to put in the time. You've got to have some money to get started and to um, continue with your real estate investing endeavors. And then, and then you've got to have the motivation because times get rough and you've got to have a big enough why that'll get you through some of the difficulties um, because you've got to look at it as almost starting a business. Like there are going to be ups and downs and the first deal you do is going to be the hardest. But also through Income Hacker, we actually teach some side hustle ideas that can help you get some additional capital so you can then invest and, uh, and start making some of the, the passive income that you're looking for. In regards to the capital that's needed, how much is that typically? I think people can get started for around $5,000. Um, okay. We don't want that to be your last $5,000, you know. We don't want that to take food off the table because it is an investment and uh, sometimes that investment doesn't pay off right away and sometimes you have to invest more um, you know and sometimes it takes more time than you think so you've got to look at it as an investment um, but if you put in the time and the work then the opportunities abound um, you've just got to dial it in and sometimes that involves changing yourself um, you might have to develop some sell skills you might have to find somebody else that has sell skills and you can do something else to add value so it's uh, it's about understanding yourself and your strengths and understanding what's necessary and getting the baseline and then putting a plan together um, which we call the next deal blueprint and executing right and how much time do people need i think so our big thing is um you don't need to quit your day job. I believe that everybody should have two hats that they wear. They have their investing hat or their long-term hat, and then they've got their day job hat. So we believe most people shouldn't quit their day job, but lots of people quit it too early. Um, maybe that's a goal of yours. If so, build up your passive income to exceed what you're making in your day job. So the, the, the short answer is 10 to 15 hours a week. Um, I just had a guy on my podcast that, you know, is a, a CFO, you know, he's working like 50, 60 hours and he spends about 10 or 15 hours and he's on his 22nd property right now. And he's just been doing it for a few years. Now he's hustling, you know, he's getting up, spending a couple hours in the morning before he goes to work. He's doing a, you know, an hour in the evening, he's maybe doing a couple hours on Saturdays, but he's balancing it, balancing the family and his cash flow is getting to the point where it's almost more than what he's making from his, his day job, um, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, that's pretty good. Good for him. All right. Brian, it's been awesome having you on my show today. Um, you know what? I forgot to ask you one last question. Yeah. What's the best way for your members to contact your company and also for people who want to listen in on your podcast? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just head on over. You, you can go to iTunes or Stitcher or however you listen, uh, Income Hacker. Um, you can also go to IncomeHacker.com and uh, subscribe and we'll send you when the newest episodes and those things are coming out. If you're looking for getting started, you can go over to DoHardMoney.com and just uh, click on apply and you know, we can uh, 
set up a consultation to see if you're in a good position to get started. Um, and if you're somebody with some cash that wants to find some alternative investments, um, you can, uh, there's a link at the bottom, become a hard money lender. And uh, we can see if that might be a fit for you as well. All right. Ryan, it's been awesome having you on my show today. I really enjoyed hearing how you grew your company so fast. Thanks, Malcolm. Really enjoyed being with you. We've been speaking with Ryan Wright, the founder and CEO of DoHardMoney.com, about his company's rapid growth. For interviews with other fast-growing, high-value sales companies, or to learn how we can accelerate your firm's high-value sales through automation, visit Eversprint.com.